I am genuinely asking this question. Why does no one care about Armenia? You want proof of this? Just switch on BBC News or CNN and you will hear the same countries being mentioned day after day. Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, China, and rightfully so. But for some reason, there are things that are happening right now in Armenia that would make you lose sleep. And 99% of you are totally clueless. I will show you the incredibly corrupt reason why the Western news stations are barely touching this subject. But first, I want to spread awareness of what's going on. If there was ever a country that had good reason not to trust other countries, Armenia would be at the very top of the list. You want proof of this? Just open a history book and you'll see exactly why. Actually, I actually want to go somewhere first. Before we go any further, I want you to know something. Some of you aren't totally ignorant to what's going on in Armenia and some of you, dare I say, you have very strong political views. But that isn't the goal of this video. Just like what I've said about Gaza, about Israel, there are innocent people right now who are caught up in all of this hatred and yet they did not choose to be born there. Is all they want is to try and survive. Is all they want, like you and I, is to lead a quiet life. And while we sit at back in our comfortable homes in the West as keyboard warriors writing out all of our political views on this situation, there are people who are trying to put their children to sleep at night, but they can't calm them down because it's all they hear is huge blasts in the sky. So know this, as I mentioned some countries' names, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, let's all be slow to speak and remember that we're not commentating on a movie script. No, this is real life with real people. So the situation is this, back in the 1920s, the Soviet Union really did a big disservice to the Armenian people. They decided to draw up borders and they put Nagorno-Karabakh inside of the Azerbaijan territory. Why was this a problem? Because inside of Nagorno-Karabakh it was made up of 94% of Armenian nationals. I don't want to be flippant but to make this simple for you to understand it's a bit like this. I don't know if you've ever been to a sporting event and you as a supporter have had to sit in your opponent's side of the stadium. So for instance I'm a Manchester United supporter and imagine I'm sitting there wearing my team's uniform surrounded by Liverpool supporters. I personally would be a little bit nervous about doing that. So take that tiny little analogy and amplify it by a thousand and that's exactly how the Armenians feel when they are technically on Azerbaijan territory. Hey, this next bit's a little bit important, so you might want to catch this. Because Armenia and Azerbaijan have been at loggerheads with one another over who should own Nagorno-Karabakh. And over the last 40 years, three serious fights have broken out. In 1988, Nagorno-Karabakh declared its intention to join Armenia, leading to our first fight, which lasted until 1991. And then the Soviet Union collapsed, which only made things worse, because now Azerbaijan was left with a huge chunk of land which was full of Armenians who is all they wanted to do was be reunited with their homeland. But now that the Soviet Union was gone, there was no one there to keep the peace. And so both countries declared their independence, neither backing down on who should own Nagorno-Karabakh. Then in 2020, as if that year wasn't hard enough, our second fight broke out. But this fight only lasted 44 days. Why? because Azerbaijan easily beats the weaker Armenia. And our third and final fight, which is happening right now, started in 2022. Nagorno-Karabakh, as you can imagine, is practically isolated from the rest of the world, and it relies on a small, tiny corridor at the south of its border. This road is the only route by which the Armenian people living inside of Nagorno-Karabakh can receive supplies. And so, in an attempt to make them surrender, Azerbaijan have blockaded it. They have cut off all all electricity, all gas, all essential goods. The people now are currently running out of food and water. But on top of all these things, they also stopped charities from entering to provide aid. So that now 99% of Armenian nationals that are living there had no choice. What did they do? In September 2023, a huge exodus took place from Nagorno-Karabakh. 
But it wasn't just the lack of food that caused 100,000 people to run from the land which their ancestors had lived in since the 4th century. No, what was one of the other reasons? Well, state-of-the-art drones were used to destroy Armenia's very dated tanks and the little defence that they did have was dismantled in just 20 four hours. In a moment's time I'm going to show you the corrupt reason why we in the West have practically been silent and we've watched the Armenian people be emptied of everything they ever owned. But first let's ask this question. Is there a single country in the world that cares about Armenia? Well the answer is going to surprise you. Russia for the longest time has sought to protect Armenia and has tried to keep the peace. But you know exactly what I'm going to say next. To say that Russia has has been distracted would be a massive understatement because all of its resources and energy have of course been focused on its own fight with the Ukraine. So with Armenia's bigger brother out of the picture, is it any wonder that they have no food, no help and when you have a history like Armenia's, is it any wonder that they ran from their homeland to find some level of peace? and safety. So, come on guys, do you want to hear the reason why we in the West have barely reported on these awful events in our news stations? Well, I'm going to choose my words carefully now, but the answer is money. Baku in Azerbaijan has a gold mine of oil and I would guess that at some point in your car you've had some level of Azerbaijani oil. However, getting the oil to us has never been a walk in the park because the only option that Azerbaijan had was to transport the oil through the Caspian Sea. And whose land borders the Caspian Sea? Russia. And as you can imagine, Azerbaijan did not want Russia to have control over their oil. Now, this is the corrupt part. The Western oil companies noticed this problem and provided a solution. They would build an oil pipeline that would run right through Europe providing fuel and energy to millions across the continent. And we in the West are also reliant on Azerbaijan gas, with companies investing 45 billion to construct a gas pipeline which again sources a huge amount of Europe. So now do you see why Armenia is not only hopeless against Azerbaijan but also voiceless now. With an oil and gas cash flow under their belts, it's no surprise that for 14 years between 2000 and 2014, Azerbaijan held the title of the fastest growing economy. And where do you think they poured their wealth into? More advanced tools to make them unbeatable. And with the West literally investing billions into Azerbaijani oil so that they get richer, is it any wonder that they have turned a blind eye to everything that is going on? Because they're not stupid. They know if they start speaking out and our news stations start reporting on this situation, is all Azerbaijan has to do is say, that's it, the deal's off. Get your oil from somewhere else. And that's why it's down to average Joes like you, like me, to start caring about little Armenia, the country that no one cares about. Okay, I've got a bit of a confession to make to you. I've not been entirely honest here because the truth is this, there is one person who cares about Armenia and that's God. And yet, as a Christian street preacher, do you know what I often hear people say? They say, well, either God doesn't exist or he does exist, but he just doesn't care about us. Just look at the mess this world is in. Well, the answer to that question is, it's actually us who have created that mess. We are the ones who have wrecked this world. World. You see, God created us as intelligent, thinking, creative people. But there's something else that God gave us when he created us in his image. He gave us a free will. So we have the right to choose to love or the right to choose to hate. He didn't make us like mindless jellyfish that are just being swept around the ocean by the current. No, he wanted us to have choices so that true love, for it to be real love, we have to make that choice to love him. Did not Jesus say, love your enemies. Did not Jesus say if someone strikes you on the right cheek, we'll turn the other cheek also. Did not Jesus Christ say, love thy neighbour as thyself? And if we all chose to obey God's commands, even if you're the most stubborn atheist listening to me right now, you've got to admit to me that this world would be a much better place if men and women just obeyed Jesus Christ. 
The way I like to think of it is like this. I want you to imagine a big, huge tree trunk. And attached to this tree trunk is an elastic band. And you also are inside of this elastic band. It's a long elastic band. It's a thick elastic band. And this band will let you travel as far away as you want. If you want to cause as much sadness in the world, you can. If you want to go around the earth and sin as much as you want, you can. If you want to go around the earth and be selfish, you can. But one day, this elastic band will run out of stretchiness. One day, this elastic band will run out of slack. And the further you travel away from that tree trunk, the more it's going to hurt when you're brought back. You ping against it. Well, my dear friends, that tree trunk represents God. And right now, God has given men and women a very loose lead. He allows us to do whatever we want to do. But one day, I promise you this, one day you will run out of slack. And God will bring you back to that tree trunk. And again, the further you go, the more it's going to hurt. The Bible says that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And one day, God's going to bring you back. You can run on for a long time away from God but one day he's going to bring you to your knees and I'm just pleading with you to settle your accounts with God through his son the Lord Jesus Christ now before it's too late. But hey now, it's not always a bad thing to be a tree hugger because if I can stay with the analogy, those of us who have stayed close to the tree trunk, those of us who have obeyed the Lord God and loved his commands and loved Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, those of us who've lived like that, we know that God is coming back to create a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no mess, there'll be no problems, and God is going to deal with all of those sinful men who in their pride have made horrible decisions that have damaged the rest of us. But in this new world, there'll be none of that. We'll only have one ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he makes no mistakes. But perhaps my answer there doesn't quite do it for you. Well, just make sure you check out this video here because I did spend a lot of time really dealing with this one big question. Why does God allow pain in the world? Just now, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take a, a little diversion because we need to ask the question, where is the evidence that God does care about Armenia? Well, apart from the personal testimonies that I've heard from Christians who live in Armenia, I also want to draw your attention to one fact, and it's this. God cares about all people, but especially the forgotten. In the Bible, we read a, a rather upsetting story. It's about a woman called Hagar. Now, Hagar was Sarah's maid, and Sarah was Abraham's wife. Now, there was a massive promise that God promised to Abraham. He said that through you, Abraham, I will bless you with numerous children, as numerous as the stars in the sky. You will have children, Abraham. But the problem was this. Sarah, his wife, who the promise was to come through, was old in age. And Sarah herself believed that she was past her sell-by date. And and she actually laughed when she heard this, thinking, there's no way God can do this for me. And so what did Sarah do? When no child came, she grew impatient and almost bitter towards the Lord. So she came up with a plan. Now, just before I tell you this, remember this. Whenever we act in haste, whenever we doubt the Lord God and think that we know best, just know this. Ruin is just around the corner. Shame will come when we choose our own direction because we should instead trust that God is a powerful God who can do anything. So, what did Sarah do? She took her maid, Hagar, and told Hagar to have relations with Abraham. And Abraham went along with it all. And what happened? Well, a little baby was conceived. And once Sarah saw this child, she was very jealous and bitter. The scripture actually says that she dealt harshly with Hagar. And because Hagar was so frightened, she ran into the wilderness with her newborn baby. So here is this young woman with no money, with no friends. Her owners have basically used her as a tool for their own gain. And she's in the middle of the wilderness with a baby and she can't provide for this baby. You can imagine how scared this woman would be. She would have felt like she was totally invisible and nobody cared about her. But know this, God cared about her and God spoke to her in that moment. And he also gave a promise to her saying, I will bless you with many, many descendants and I have seen your affliction. I have heard your cries, Hagar. 
And so what did Hagar do when she realized this? She was stunned and she called the Lord Elroy, which means you are the God who sees me. You see, my dear friends, whoever you are, wherever you're watching this from right now, I want you to know something. You might be going through a really difficult time and you might feel totally forgotten, totally invisible to the rest of the world. But I want you to know something. God has not forgotten you and God is the God you can call Elroy because he is the God who sees you and wants to hold your hand through any pain that you're going through right now. I'm not sure if this is helpful or not, but I myself have many doubts and I have lots of anxieties but there's one thing I don't doubt and it's this that God loves me and God cares about me and not just me but he cares about you and he cares about Armenia you see the Lord God knows what it is to be forgotten think about this he has given us a wonderful earth and every day there are quite literally billions of people who breathe his air. Every day there are quite literally billions of people who eat his food, drink his water and live on his world. And yet, so many of those people don't even say thank you once to him. So often they think about a million things, but the thought of God never enters into their mind. God himself. The Lord Jesus Christ knew what it was to be forgotten. He had 12 very close friends. One of his friends decided to betray him just for a bit of extra cash. And all of the disciples, except for John, all of them scattered and left him as he was nailed to that cross. He knew what it was to be forgotten and neglected. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, do you know what he cried out? Now, many people get this wrong, but Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a prophecy of something that was going to happen in the future. And people think, no, he was just quoting it for the Pharisees because they knew it. That's not the case. When we look at the scripture, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, my God, my God, why have you left me? It marries up with the rest of the scripture. Here's another one to think about. In Isaiah 53, what does it say? It says, yet yeah, it was the Lord's will to crush him, that's Jesus, and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, that's the clue. That's what happened on the cross. The Lord God made Jesus Christ into an offering for our sin. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might inherit the righteousness of God. Does that make sense? So the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is because God the Father was crushing him on the cross. And all the way through eternity, they've had this wonderful relationship. But at the cross, it felt like the Lord God was leaving him, was turning his back on him because Jesus Christ was becoming our sin on the cross. He was becoming all the rottenness, all the ugly things that you and I have ever done. It was laid on him. The weight of that sin was pressed on Jesus Christ and their God was pleased, as the scripture says, to crush his beloved son because he had to pay the price for that sin. What goes through your mind as you think of that? That God the Father effectively turned his back on his son on the cross so that you could be forgiven. And then imagine Jesus when he entered into the realm of the dead. He would have felt forgotten. But what does the scripture say? The Lord God hadn't forgotten him. It says, he will not let his Holy One see decay. And the Lord God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised Jesus Christ back to life on the third day and he conquered the grave triumphant. And all of that, that amazing message, which at times is hard to understand, that amazing message is for you and for me so that we know that we've got salvation in Christ alone. Because just think about this. If he is the God, who sees me. That means he doesn't just see me, all the good things I've ever done, even though there's very few that I've done, but he also sees the shameful things I've done, the things in the dark, the things in secret and we have nothing that we can offer God. There is no good work that will appease him. No, the only thing that can save us, the only thing that can scrub away and wash our sins away is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we need the one who knew what it was to be forgotten and left on the cross. We need him to save us, to rescue us and to give us eternal life. So you come to him right now. 
when you put your trust in him because he promises he'll never turn you away. And I'm kind of sorry if I'm repeating myself, but if you would like to see an answer to that huge question, click here right now.